Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We come today to Genesis chapter 33, verse 1. And this is our 32nd study in the book of Genesis. And Father, we ask that you would add your blessing to the word that we are about to read. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> okay, Genesis 33, verse 1. Now Jacob lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, there Esau was coming, and with him were four hundred men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two maidservants. Being a leader like Jacob means making tough decisions. It would be easy if the choice was always between good and bad, but sometimes it's between bad and worse. Jacob will decide which family members will be in front and which will be in the back, and would therefore at least have a chance of escaping if Esau attacks. Two. And he put the maidservants and their children in front, Leah and her children behind, and Rachel and Joseph last. He puts Rachel and her son Joseph way in the back. But that does not mean that he didn't care about the rest of the family. Because look at the next verse. Then he crossed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times. Jacob went in front of them all. No doubt he loved Rachel more than anyone, but he loved them all more than himself. If Esau is going to get to his family, he will have to go through Jacob first. Verse 4 But Esau ran to meet him, and embraced him, and fell on his neck, and kissed him, and they wept. Esau is totally different than what he seemed to be when Jacob sent him that friendly message in the last chapter. Totally different than how Jacob remembered him from 20 years earlier. And I believe it was the prayers that Jacob prayed that made the difference. Verse 5 And he lifted his eyes and saw the women and children and said, Who are these with you? So he said, The children whom God has graciously given your servant? Most people would have answered, They are my family. But not Jacob. Not anymore. When your relationship with God is alive and well, and when Jesus Christ is number one with you, then giving him glory and including him in your conversation will be the most natural thing in the world for you. We see that's what's happening right here. 6. Then the maidservants came near, they and their children, and bowed down. And Leah also came near with her children, and they bowed down. Afterwards, Joseph and Rachel came near, and they bowed down. And I know the bowing was cultural, but 21st century America could learn something from it. Talking about young people and children showing respect for adults. Verse 8 Then Esau said, What do you mean by all this company which I met? And he said, These are to find favor in the sight of my Lord. Jacob says, In essence, I'm trying to buy favor from you, brother. Jacob knows he doesn't deserve it, so he's trying to purchase it. 9 but Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. Jacob's big gift and his well-thought-out plan to deliver it in five stages was all for nothing. It did not work to soften Esau's heart because it did, he didn't want it and he didn't need it. Jacob prayed. Esau's favor is an answer to prayer 
Not the gift that he finagled. Verse 10 And Jacob said, No, please, if I have found favor in your sight, then receive my present from my hand, inasmuch as I have seen your face, as though I had seen the face of God, and you were pleased with me. Esau wants to be friends. Jacob doesn't have to pay him off. But Esau, or Jacob insists that Esau take the gift anyway. You know, in the past, Jacob had been a real taker. And now he's a giver. Close walk with God will turn a selfish person into a giver. Look at verse 11. Please take my blessing that is brought to you, because God has dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough. So he urged him, and he took it. Back in verse 9, Esau said, I have enough. Here in verse 11, Jacob says, I have enough. Same English word, different Hebrew words. Actually, Esau said, I have much. Jacob said, I have everything. Jacob had everything because he had a close walk with God. See, you can be a pauper and feel richer than the richest man on earth if you are close to Christ. Jacob had all that he needed. Esau had a lot. But he didn't, he didn't have the relationship with God that Jacob had. So there was something still lacking. Verse 12. Then Esau said, Let us take our journey. Let us go, and I will go before you. But Jacob said to him, My Lord knows that the children are weak, and the flocks and the herds which are nursing are with me. And if the men should drive them hard one day, all the flock will die. Esau wanted to stay with his brother, Jacob. And that's a nice thought, but probably not a smart one. They were nice to each other here. However, they are still as different as night and day. Verse 14 Please let my Lord go on ahead before his servant. I will, read, or I will lead on slowly at a pace which the livestock can go, that can go before me, and the children are able to endure until I come to my Lord and seer. Jacob's family has to be priority over pleasing his brother. And his animals are his business. And as a result, he tells Esau to go ahead of him while he travels at a pace that the animals and his children can handle. 15. And Esau said, Now let me leave with you some of the people who are with me. But he said, What need is there? Let me find favor in the sight of my Lord. Esau had shown Jacob a, a lot of favor. And now he asks for one more thing. He says, Allow me to decline your offer of help. Jacob wants to be polite, but he does not want to be connected to his brother. It may not be smart to hang out with certain people, but there is never any reason to be impolite to them. Verse 16 So Esau returned that day on his way to Seir. Seir was south of the Holy Land. Now, Jacob had told Esau that he would follow him there. But that would be a mistake. I say that because God had told Jacob to return to the land, not to go south of it. So let's see what he's going to do. 17. And Jacob journeyed to Sukkoth, built himself a house, and made booths for his livestock. Therefore the name of that place is called Sukkoth. And it means booths. Now Jacob either led, or I should say he either lied to his brother when he said that he'd meet him down in Seir, or he meant it and then remembered that that would not be God's will. Either way, Jacob did the right thing by going to the Holy Land. And either way, he owed his brother an explanation and maybe an apology. 18. Then Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Padan Aram, and he pitched his tent before the city. The city of Shechem 
is in an area close to where John the Baptist did his baptizing about 2,000 years later in the time of Christ. 19. And he bought a parcel of land where he had pitched his tent from the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for 100 pieces of money. God promised Jacob that he and his descendants would own that entire land but the time had not yet come for them to take possession of it so Jacob paid for the land that he and his household were living on you know as Christians we can look forward to the future but we should still do what's correct in the now also verse 20 then he he erected an altar there and called it El El Eloi Israel El Eloi Israel 20 years earlier Jacob left home and now by God's grace he returns with this huge family some things went well and sometimes things went wrong during those 20 years but God was big enough and smart enough to work them all together for Jacob's good so Jacob builds an altar because he has a lot of good reasons for worshiping God let's look at verse 1 of chapter 34 now Dinah the daughter of Leah whom she had born to Jacob went out to see the daughters of the land several years passed between chapters 33 and chapter 34 Dinah Jacob's daughter is probably 14 or 15 years old here and she wants female companionship and since she's not going to get it at home with her 11 brothers she heads to town looking for it 2. and when Shechem the son of Hamor the Hivite prince of the country saw her he took her and lay with her and violated her and her life was pretty much shot after what he did to her in those days a girl who was violated like she was could never have a happy normal relationship with a man so as far as that is concerned anyway her life is ruined at probably age 14 3 his soul was strongly attracted to Dinah the daughter of Jacob and he loved the young woman and spoke kindly to the young woman and uh, so what too late save it it doesn't matter tender words don't get it done they don't change anything 4 so Shechem spoke to his father Hamor saying get me this young woman as a wife and you know he doesn't seem to be the least bit broken over what he did he does not say dad I did a terrible thing there's certainly no mention of him apologizing to her no repentance just get me and his dad isn't any better no parental rebuke no well you're gonna to have to pay for this son nothing five and Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah his daughter now his sons were with his livestock in the field so Jacob held his peace until they came Jacob kept his composure which takes a lot of grace in a situation like that verse 6 then Hamor the father of Shechem went out to Jacob to speak with him and so the father of this rapist speaks to the father of the victim 7 and the sons of Jacob came in from the field when they heard it and the men were grieved and very angry because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter a thing which ought not be done it is very refreshing to hear such a thing ought not be done many are afraid to say that many are afraid to say that something is wrong today but God says it for us he tells us what's right and what's wrong and what's good and what's bad verse 8 Actually, I think we'll stop right here and we'll pick up in verse 8 in our next study.